Hello. In this video, I'm going to tell you about the Velocity Verlet algorithm, and I'm hopefully going to give you all the information you will need to start writing your first molecular dynamics code. Before I get onto that, though, let's just try to take a moment to understand why molecular dynamics is used in statistical mechanics. In the first assignment for this module, you learned how to calculate ensemble averages by explicit enumeration. I taught you how to calculate these ensemble averages when the temperature is constant. In this video, we are going to consider how you calculate the ensemble average when the energy is fixed. But the method is similar to what you did to calculate the ensemble averages when the temperature is fixed. In actual fact, it is probably easier to calculate these ensemble averages when the energy is fixed. So, without further preamble, allow me to explain the meaning of the symbol on the slide. The A in angle brackets here means the average energy of the quantity A for a system with an energy of E. To be clear, A here could be any property that interests us. For example, it might be the magnetization, the volume, or even the microscopic coordinates of one of the particles in the system. The only requirement we have of A is that it must be possible to calculate this quantity for every microstate the system might adopt. The reason we need to be able to calc A, calculate A for each microstate is that the ensemble ex average is given by this expression. In this expression, the sums run over all the microstates the system can be in. Ai is the value of the property A for the ith microstate. Lastly, the delta that appears in the numerator and denominator is a Kronecker delta, which is 1 if EI is equal to E and is 0 otherwise. This whole expression is thus just a fancy way of saying that the average, ven energy, average value of the property A when the energy is E can be calculated by taking the end states that have an energy of E and adding together all their A values and then dividing this by N. Now, as you hopefully recognised after the end of the first exercise, the problem with using this expression is that for any modestly sized system, the number of microstates is enormous. We thus simply cannot explicitly enumerate all of them and check if they have an energy of E, as it would take far too long. We thus have to cheat and instead generate a small sample of the states with energy E and hope that the ratio that we get from this is approximately equal to the real value that we would get if we could enumerate the, for the real experiments if we could really do the experiment and enumerate all the states. In other words, what we have to do is use the ideas from Monte Carlo that I explained in the pre-readings and compute basically a, num a set of states all that, that all have the same energy and, that have, uh, and, and compute the A values of those states and divide the sum of all those A values by the number of states generated. The problem, the difference with the first thing is that now we are not explicitly enumerating of the states, we just have a subset. The obvious question at this stage is how do we can generate a collection of states that all have the same energy? This is not easy for the lattice models we looked at in the first exercise. If our Hamiltonian has a kinetic term and a potential term though, in other words, if the state of the system of interest depends on both the positions of the particles and their velocities, generating lots of states with the same energy is very easy. We can just solve Newton's equations of motion. When we generate states by solving these equations, we are guaranteed to generate states that all have the same energy, as Newton's equations of motion are conservative. The total energy of a system that is moving in accordance with Newton's law does not change with time. Cool, eh? 
There is still a problem, however, which is that it is only possible to solve Newton's equations analytically for systems with two particles. If there are more than two particles, then there is no analytic solution. Even this is only a small problem, however, as we can always solve the equations numerically, which is precisely where the velocity Verley algorithm comes into play. This algorithm is essentially just a method for solving Newton's laws of motion numerically. The velocity Verley algorithm takes one parameter which we will call delta in what follows. This is the so-called simulation time step. The structures that we will generate using this algorithm will be frames in a trajectory. Each of these frames will tell us the positions and velocities of the system's constituent particles at instances in time that are separated by delta. Let's suppose that we have the positions and velocities of the atoms at time t. We can calculate the forces acting on the particles at this time by computing the negative derivative of the potential. From the forces, we can then calculate the acceleration of each particle. We thus have the velocity, the position, and the acceleration at that time. The first step in the velocity Verley algorithm is to use these three quantities to calculate the velocity the system would have after a time of delta over 2. This can be straightforwardly calculated using the expression shown on the slide here. The expression we are using here is the SUVAT equation V equals U plus AT, which you should know. Once we have the velocity at the half time step, we then update the positions using that velocity and the equation shown on this slide. The equation here simply uses the fact that the distance travelled is approximately the velocity at the half time step multiplied by the time of this, the length of the step, delta. Once you have new positions for the atoms, you then recalculate the forces by computing the potential from the new positions. The force is obtained by taking the negative derivative of this potential. You then get to the acceleration from the force by dividing the force by the mass of the particle. The final step is then to repeat step one and update the velocities one further half time step, but with the new accelerations that have been computed from the forces. At this point, you now have the positions, velocities and accelerations at time t plus delta, and thus you can return to the start of the loop and repeat these stages ad infinitum to get the, time, the positions, velocities and forces at times t plus 2 delta, t plus 3 delta, and so on and so forth. The code here shows how the velocity Verley algorithm that I've just described is implemented in Python. Here we are writing a code to study the dynamics of a single particle whose state is a function of two parameters, its position and its velocity. Notice that the initial positions and velocities have to be set before you run any dynamics. You also need to calculate the potential and forces at this initial position. You can then do as many steps of molecular dynamics as you choose. In this code, the algorithm that is described by the flowchart is being run 500 times. The first line in this code is the first line in the flowchart. The second line in this loop is the second line in the flowchart. The third is the third line in the flowchart. And this is the final step in the flowchart. And that is pretty much all there is to it. Hopefully, with that explanation and with what you have learned about calculating tensions and forces from the previous exercises, you should be able to write your first MD code. Good luck and, and thanks, as always, for your attention.